Okay, hello and welcome to the July 26, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Um, we're going to start out with um, some new appointments. So we have Jason Dorney on the CONCOM, and I'd like to start by just doing a brief introduction of everybody here. Um, maybe just a couple sentences about who you are. I, I know we just did this, Bruce, because <laughs> you were here last time. But we're going to do it again for the sake because we, we're not often afforded this kind of introduction. So let's just do a brief introduction of like how long we've been here and <laughs> basically what our background and expertise is. So I'm going to start with Jason. All right. Thanks, Michelle. I, uh, I've been in Amherst for a little over a year now, and I work in the erosion, sediment control, and stormwater management industry. I work for a um, civil engineering firm uh, that is located in San Diego, and we uh, I've been in that industry for, oh, just over 17 years now, and I'm uh, really, really excited to join, and uh, I'm glad that I uh, I've been appointed and I'm, I'm really happy to work with everybody and excited to to be on the commission here. Great. Welcome, Jason. We appreciate your expertise on this commission. Um, on to Bruce. Bruce Stedman. I have been in Amherst for six years. I am the recently retired executive director of the Conway School of Landscape Design. Um, I was an I went to the school as a student in 1978. So you can see I have a long history in the region uh, off and on. And so I have worked on a lot of these issues in a variety of ways over 30 or 40 years. Uh, most of my experience was as a environmental policy mediator and facilitator of discussions and decision making. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the question of this commission and its work relative to climate and the climate crisis. And as one of our site visits today about the um, rehabilitation of wetlands or making sure that we can bring them back if we can. Great, thanks. Laura? Everyone, welcome. I'm Laura Pagliarulo. Um, I, uh, my background, I've been in the renewable energy industry for about 20 years now. So I, um, I'm very, mostly familiar with um, the solar siting process, um, which can come in handy from time to time on this commission. Thanks, Sarah. Alex? Hi, welcome. I joined the commission last September. I'm a relative newbie, and I've also volunteered to take notes. And I sent you, Aaron. Uh, you know, okay, good minutes from last time. And I retired five years ago from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where I worked my entire career in the regulatory field, dealing mostly with streams, rivers, hydroelectric projects, fish passage, that kind of stuff. And um, it's been a joy to be on the commission and get to know the streets of Amherst. Thanks, Alex. Um, Michelle, and I've been on the commission for two years. I've lived in Amherst. Uh, <laughs> 30 years, um, who's counting? But uh, yeah, my my current career and background is in uh, land trust and conservation easements and conservation and management and long-term financial planning in perpetuity for um, ecosystems and sensitive and endangered species. And we have Dave Zomek, who I think you've met, and Erin, do you guys want to introduce yourself briefly or have you already touched base? Sure. Dave Zomack, I'm the assistant town manager, Jason. I think we we met during the interview process. Welcome. Glad to have you aboard. Um, it's it's a great group, but uh, the group is changing a little bit. I won't say how long I've been in Amherst, um, but a while. Um, 
and I'm kind of a generalist. I, I play a lot of roles in town. I work on conservation. I do most of the land acquisition for the town. Um, I also do affordable housing. Um, I was just appointed today, I believe, as the interim health director uh, because oh, our health director wow. was leaving on Friday. <laughs> Um, I also do a lot of work with recreation projects and, and of course, work very closely with Aaron. And um, yeah, so happy to, mm -hmm. to support the commission in its good work and really excited to kind of uh, begin to, to put a lot more focus on land management policy, um, you know, for the future, because all of us are really in these, in these seats for just a short period of time. So uh, happy to have you on board. Um, I'm Erin Jock. I'm the Wetlands Administrator, um, Amherst native, and um, I've been with the town going on four years now. Um, I've worked with a couple other towns as a, a conservation agent position. Amherst is a little different as the Wetlands Administrator, uh, but I have a, a strong background in agriculture, conservation, and GIS. Great, thanks everyone. Okay, so we're gonna move right along to land management updates. Um, oh, sorry, Dave, director's report, on to you. Yeah, I don't have a lot to report tonight. Um, it's kind of status quo out there. We are short on staff, like many departments, many organizations. Um, so we're just doing some tread and water out there with trail clearing. Um, I've been doing the Puffer's Pond testing myself, just so the commission knows, you know, we test Puffer's Pond every Wednesday, it takes 24 hours to culture the sample. We, we samples, we do that through the DPW wastewater plant. And then we, um, we share those uh, results on uh, Thursdays. So with all the, the rainy weather we've been having, Puffer's is, is a little bit of a roller coaster in terms of bacteria levels. We've been lucky so far. I think we've only posted it really one one out of six weeks of testing. So just so you know, um, there's information on the website. In fact, we're, we're, we're putting an FAQ up there because there have been a lot of questions about what the results mean. Um, so we do that every every week and we're trying we're doing our best to keep up with the basics at um, at um, Puffer Spawn, trash removal, trash cleanup, um, parking, uh, some some trail clearing and, um, and and other maintenance up there. We're still searching for an assistant land manager. As I said, I have said the last couple of meetings, please, if you know anyone who would like to get into the field, we have a full-time job with full benefits. It's on the website and we're accepting applications until that position is full. Uh, it's really a hands-on position working out there with Brad Borderweek, working with Aaron, uh, working with myself and other departments on trails, uh, trailhead parking, kiosks, um, maintenance, you name it. Um, we're beginning to think about some, some brush hogging. Uh, we're, we're beyond the, uh, the typical date for the accepted date for grassland birds, um, July 15th. And frankly, with our staffing situation, we probably won't get on a, a tractor and, and Brad won't until late in August, maybe early in September. We try to avoid those areas where we know we have um, terrestrial turtles, um, such as on the Hoyoke Range and, and some other conservation areas in South and um, North East Amherst. And then lastly, we are planning, Aaron and I, um, although our time has not permitted us to do this, yet we are planning some tours of Hickory Ridge just to update the community, update the town council, update the commission, I would imagine these would happen right after Labor Day and we'll we'll get you that information, but we wanna kind of do a walk and talk with folks. There's been a lot of questions from the public about solar, about the accessible trail, and, um, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to meet with, um, Aaron, help me out. It's not AMP anymore. I, uh, Claire, uh, Pure Sky. Sky. Thank you, Pure yep. Sky's representatives in early September and they'll be giving us an update uh, out in the field on where they are with the solar project. So I would expect those to happen late late August or more likely right after Labor Day. So happy to take any of your questions, but it's, uh, it's just keeping trails open, keeping uh, um, you know, trash and other, other, other things off of trails and Puffer's Pond and Mount Pollux, et cetera. 
it's busy up there. There's a lot of people. And to be honest, getting back to Buffer's Pond, when even when we have bacteria levels that are higher than state um, uh, accepted levels, and we post the pond, people still swim. It's really at their own risk. So, but people don't adhere to the signs. So. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So when when that that happens, is there a sign posted at the pond that says "Don't swim"? Or... Oh, there are probably thirty signs that go. Oh, up. wow. Okay, yeah. so they're well warned. Okay. Yeah, they're well warned from the parking lots on the North Beach and South Beach all the way. Okay. In. Yeah. So. Yeah, I certainly know some people who don't heed. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there are diehard swimmers. They will yeah. swim matter what they swim right into November sometimes so people mm -hmm. love the pond regardless of bacteria levels great thank you okay well we'll move into land management updates um so we have Mount Pollock's wedding proposal do we have um the applicant here today or the applicant was not able to join tonight um but I did have a lengthy conversation with her this afternoon um so as far as the land management application the proposal is a, a wedding of um 30 people at mount pollux they're proposing to bring like a rug for the bride and groom to stand on um the chairs for the attendants and they would have a small um uh, radio to play uh a stereo system to play a song for them during their ceremony um they asked about doing um, biodegradable confetti, and I said, I don't think that that's the commission's going to go for that. Um, and they are going to do just a small sign at the bottom of the trail that basically is like a, an easel with a little board that says wedding with a directional arrow. Um, I did warn them about the parking at the um, entryway and that the property is open to the public, you know, during daylight hours. And they were fine with that. They're actually going to have um, a shuttle um, deliver people just in case the parking lot is full. So, um, yeah, I mean, it seemed like a pretty a pretty standard um, a, a pretty standard ask, I guess. They're um, not um, looking for any thing that's out of the ordinary in terms of the wedding requests. But I, I could put up the application if folks want to see it. Um, and if anybody has questions of the applicant, um, I'm sure she'd be happy to field them, uh, but she couldn't be here tonight because of a work obligation. Okay. And it was about 30 people, I think, was the attendees. Correct. Commis commissioners, any comments, questions on this one? Bruce? When is it? Yes, it is August 25th from 5 to 5.45 in the evening. Just for historical context, we've been allowing weddings up there for longer than I've worked for the town. Um, prior to my arrival here, um, we we actually did require a fee for using Mount Pollux for weddings. That fee actually couldn't really go to the town. It probably could, but it go into the general fund. So it actually went to Kestrel, and then Kestrel granted it back to the town. Um, and that's something I think that the, um, you know, the, the subcommittee could look at. Um, we've talked about fees. I think Laura in, in meetings past um, brought that up. And so I think it's, I think it's on the docket for, yeah. for looking at fees as part of our subcommittee, looking at land management and policies. Yeah. But so I um, think um, I'm not I, yeah, I, that in August, but yeah. I think that that's great. That's exactly what I was going to mention, Dave. Um, and I think this wedding is very short. Um, there was an issue where we had permitted that filmmaking, if you recall, yeah, so I which remember. was a full day affair, which, you know, effectively my concern is always that it's a public space. And even though um, people understand that it's ac accessible to the public, you know, the space is small. Um, and if you're having an event on top, it other people don't feel welcome to, um, it's not like there's one section over here, what there's really one access. Um, yeah. And um, my main concern is parking. And as long as we clearly 
clearly um, communicate with them that, and, and I think the shuttle is a great idea. Yeah. I always recommend there's plenty of parking down at the South Amherst Common. Um, mm -hmm. Around the Common is, is a traditional place for people to park both for religious services, Munson Library, mm -hmm. 4th of mm -hmm. July, et cetera, et cetera. So there's plenty of parking down there. They could shuttle people in minutes up to Mount Pollock. So that's great. But you're not able to park on the side of the road, like the main road near Mount No, Pollock. you are it's not. Like you they are should not. not park on Southeast oh. Street. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah they, I, I did let them know no parking along the sides of the driveway or on Southeast mm -hmm. Street for public safety reasons. So they're aware yeah, of that. Right. Super. I have no issues with it. I'm fine with it. Okay, hearing hearing no others. I think do we do we need to move on this one? Okay. I'm looking yeah, I'll make a motion to, to accept the wedding um at Mount Pollux. What is the date we have here? August twenty five. Or August twenty fifth from five to five forty five. I'll second that. Okay, Laura on the first, Jason on the second. Um Jason. Aye. Alex. Aye. Laura. Aye. Bruce. Aye. I'm an aye. Great. Okay. Uh, moving on. So we had an amethyst brick research project. Everyone probably saw this in the packets. It was for a, a moth sampling research project. Um, I um, communicate with Aaron via the applicant requesting some abstract methodology objectives for the for the project because the light trapping was a non-discriminant and lethal method, which currently is against our bylaws for conservation land, which is um, well, basically lethal methods of, of trapping wildlife on our conservation lands is not allowed. So they withdrew the application. So we're going to move on from that. But um, moving forward, I think I'm just letting people know that I'm probably going to um, ask for incorporation in our land use subcommittee for a um, just general, just as a trustees land, the trustees of reservation do um, when some someone submits a research project on conservation lands to also submit methods, abstract and objectives for um, any kind of wildlife collecting. So not an issue for today, but we're going to move on for that. So I think we can move on to our hearings, correct, Erin? We're good. Um, so it's 721 right now. We, okay, what um, can we do? Yeah, um, let me see. Is we it, can make CRs. It, Sorry, oh, yeah, we, that'd be great. CRs, is anyone going to give a report on the subcommittee's work or no? Or is that we right? haven't met since the last um, the last CONCOM meeting. So we are meeting next week. So we're every other week. Gotcha. We we had a sort of a strange scheduling, but yeah, we're 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 on off weeks. So um, you want to say what I can about the CR. Yeah. Um yeah, so I think everything was in your packet. Um so I guess the, the short, the long and short of it is that um, we are following suit with a number of land trusts across the Commonwealth, trying to address issues that have arisen from some changes in, in IRS regulations, the land trust community working with the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth the Department of Conservation Services that grants conservation restrictions has advised owners of a pathway by which they can amend their CR. So essentially, and I think there's a memo from me that the town council that went to the town council uh, essentially allows CR um, owners, if they choose, um, to um, apply for a, an amendment to their CRs to essentially safeguard their tax benefits that they received as part of the donation of land. Um, and in this case, um, is there, this is up on um, Mar Market Hill and Flat Hills Road, I believe. And it's the only, only owner that really um, 
there's one other um, owner who came to us on Southeast Street and he decided he didn't feel like he was at any risk with the IRS. So he withdrew his, his application. Um, we had one um, CR in Shutesbury or Pelham that went through the um, that went through the town council. But again, you are not involved in that because it's out of the town of Amherst. And in this case, it was the the only one that came to us was the Lorer CR. Um, I see no harm in doing this. I don't think it compromises the intent of the CRs in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't affect that they are in perpetuity. It's really kind of it's it's the ultimate precaution for the for the donor for the for the uh, donor of the CR. Um, I don't know, Michelle, if you've had any other experience on a national level with these. I have talked to a number of lawyers, and to be honest, some of them are. I would say it's 50-50 split. Many lawyers think this is not necessary at all. It was mainly, I think, designed the IRS. The change in the IRS uh, rules and regulations were designed to make sure that there were not egregious um, uh, people taking advantage of um, appraisals and donated value at a much, much higher level than anything we see here in Massachusetts and particularly in Amherst. So um, there were some abuses some years ago of these donations of conservation land where people were taking millions of dollars in tax uh, uh, benefits over time. Uh, that's not the case with the Laura CR or with any CRs we do here uh, in Amherst. So I, I see no harm in doing this. Yeah, so um, I do have some experience with this because professionally we had to deal with it. Um, it's it's about um, addressing the safe harbor agreements within a conservation easement and predatory safe harbor agreements. So for example, a conservation easement set upon a land that would then allow like a golf course, which then maybe it was extinguished and the extinguishment might have to pay for the golf course value. So I don't see that it was very relevant for um, Amherst conservation lands. And according to the lawyers that I have been involved with, um, many of them, as Dave said, didn't even recommend doing anything or doing a risk assessment to see if anything was needed. But mainly up to landowners to decide what they wanted to do. So I have no concerns about it based on what I know. And I don't think it affects any kind of conservation values as far as the commission is concerned, but um, welcoming any comments from the commission. Okay, hearing none, yeah, go ahead, Dave. No, I was just gonna say if there aren't any I do know that um, Bruce had raised the issue or the question of um, the actual signatory page was done before the new members joined. So we, if if you're in favor and, and do take a, a vote in favor uh, of approving this amendment, we will just change that before you come into town hall and sign it. Adding the new members, obviously taking off the old members of the commission. So if you want to note that in in a in a motion, that's fine. Alex, I see your hand up. Yeah. So Dave, what's the action item for us on this? This is the second time this subject has come up. It came up at our last meeting. It's in the minutes. And essentially the same thing was said now. And now I understand the reason it's coming up is because we have something to sign. Right. It's to approve the amendment, which um, is in your packet. Yeah. Okay. The amendment for the CR for the law for the lower conservation restriction. Okay. Okay. If, if no one else has any comments or concerns, I'm looking for a motion on this one. Oh, no hands. Uh, what's what is our motion to approve the amendments to the lower conservation easement? Wouldn't yes. that, wouldn't that be done by us signing it? Typically, you have to take a motion and a motion to approve and sign, and I would call it a conservation restriction. Um, so, all 
All right, so uh, I'll make the motion to approve the lower trust conservation restriction amendment as presented. I'll second that. All right, Jason on the first, Laura on the second. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. I'm an aye. So what? I have a question. Um, what's the deadline for signing it? And when will the new page be available? Um, <clears throat> there isn't, well, it's a long story, but the actual deadline for these was July 24th. The, the attorneys who are working on this, who believe it's important to do it, also believe that if you if we get this in, if if uh, communities across the Commonwealth get get it in as close to the twenty fourth of July as possible, you're safeguarding the owner, you know, from any IRS action. So we'll okay. have the new page. I, I think we'll have the new page ready for signature tomorrow. So at your leisure this week, next week, if you're in town, Monday through Friday, eight to four thirty. Okay. If you can just stop by the mezzanine of town hall. Angela Mills will have the signatory page. I, I asked this because I'm going to Chicago on Monday for 10 days. So I need to come in there Friday if I'm going to sign it. That would be great. And I'll work with Angela to, um, we'll get the everybody, the new signatory page done tomorrow. Yeah, and since the 24th has passed, the sooner the better. Right. Yeah. I remember this uh, deadline being kind of a hot topic, Dave, but it seems like it's it's been um, extended a bit. I mean, <laughs> I I had a meeting in maybe March about it, but anyway, as soon as possible. Yeah, as soon as possible is fine. Okay. I, generally, we receive an email from Aaron saying that the document is ready to sign in, in Angela's um, office. So maybe watch out for that. Um, okay, I, I any would, other? I would just assume it's it's ready to sign by noon tomorrow. I mean, during this okay. meeting, I'm going to send out an email to uh, to uh, Angela. So I think she'll have it done by noon tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Um, so then moving on, um, are we on to hearings, Erin, or should yes. we? Yes. Okay. Yep, you're good to go. All right, so we have a new NOI. Um, this public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Bylaws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the town of Wetlands, town Wetlands as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. And this NOI is the tie-in bond for Eversource Energy proposed equipment and switchgear upgrades within the 17K substation expansion of the substation fence line at 246 College Street and installation of 21 manholes and three distribution poles from the roadway along College Street from the intersection of Northampton Road, South Pleasant Street to 246 College Street. Okay, do we have a project proponent here? Yes. I don't know. I I put um Chris LaRose and Katie Wilkins in the room. I don't know if there if there are other folks. Um I can't see if anybody's raising their hand because I'm doing a share screen right now. Um I don't Can know you go anybody... to the next slide? I'm sorry? Just go to the next slide. Well, we haven't gone over procedures yet. I don't know. If okay, I'm going to do procedures. Sorry. Um, just... So, um, general procedures for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes of the agenda. So, starting today, I propose that we start with staff comments first, followed by pro um, project proponents' comments. So, we'll have five minute presentations by the staff, five minutes from the applicant, five minutes for public comment or two minutes per person, five minutes for conservation, conservation commissioners, and then revisions, all plan revisions are required by Friday prior to meeting at noon. And for all presenters and members of the public, 
clearly state your name, address of the project, who you are representing, as well as if you have any preferred, preferred pronouns. For all members of the public, please clearly state your name, address, and note if you have any preferred pronouns. And I'm just going to say right here that 46 Faring Street has been ex um, extended because we have a problem with quorum tonight. We just don't have all members needed for the quorum. So if you're here for is it 46 or 49, I can't remember anymore. <laughs> Either one, we're extending that to, what is our date, August? August 9th. 9th, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, let me see my notes here. Um, I think it's 7, 7.35. Yeah, UMass will be continued to 7.30 and 46 bearing to 7.35 on um, August 9th. Okay, so back to time bond. I see Chris and Sam, but Aaron, would you like to give us your staff comments first? Yes. Um, so just a couple quick things, um, and these it would be great if the applicant could um, uh, address these um, when they comment, but um, I noticed that the, the poles that are proposed across the street from the um, the substation location are right on the, the edge of the natural heritage polygon. And so um, it, it doesn't appear, and unless I missed something that natural heritage was notified for the project. So it seems like the proposed work for the polls are, is outside of an HESP area. Um, so I don't know if you could address that. And also um, if the work is proposed outside of an HESP area, um, but you're working really close to it, one suggestion I would have is that we sort of flag the boundary of that polygon to make sure that um, folks that are doing work in those areas know to, you know, be cautious and not um, uh, extend their work area into the, the natural heritage polygons. Um, on the stormwater, uh, on the stormwater report, I noticed that the pre and post um, uh, calculations for runoff were basically exactly the same, exactly balanced. And I took a look at the pre and post um, land use data for the uh, that was included in the, the stormwater report. And I noticed that the pervious impervious balance was like, was perfectly balanced. And so that's why we're seeing a, um, you know, no net change basically in runoff calculations for the site. Um, I was hoping that the applicant in their presentation could touch on areas where impervious surfaces are expanding and areas where impervious surfaces are being reduced um, for the commission so that we can just get a better sense of um, the numbers in the stormwater report. And then the last item is uh, uh, one of the things that I recommend when we're um, potentially exceeding that 20% threshold for alteration of the buffer zone is um, for the applicant to calculate what the percentage of alteration is and to come up with a proposal for mitigation. Um, I know that a proposal came in sort of um, at the last minute, so I was hoping that the applicant could review that with the Conservation Commission. And those are my comments. Thanks, Erin. Um, Chris, Sam, or Kate, do you wanna respond? Sure. Um, Kate Wilkins with Tie and Bond. Um, I don't know if you want me to give the address of Tie and Bond or- Fine. Oh, okay. Um, here with uh, Chris LaRose from Eversource, as well as Sam Baluti from uh, Tie and Bond as well. Um, as was stated, this project is at the College Street at the Amherst substation, uh, Amherst 17K substation. The plan is to extend the substation fence, um, do some upgrades within the substation itself. That's why the expansion is needed. Um, and then uh, some distribution work. So that involves the installation of the 21 manholes, as well as the conduit connecting the manholes within the existing uh, paved roadway of College Street in the existing paved parking lot right in front of um, the substation and then along a portion of the side of um, the existing substation along the east side. Um, the project itself 
will impact about 4,255 square feet of buffer zone. Um, of that, we calculated 3.5% of that buffer zone impact to we're, we're under that 20% threshold within the area or overall area of the site. Um, I guess touching on some of the uh, comments from uh, Aaron in particular, we do realize we are on the NHESP habitat um, right along the edge of that polygon along the south side of College Street. We're not doing work inside that polygon, but very much agree with mapping off that area and we will make sure um, and even if it's conditioned of marking off the polygon to make sure that the pole replacements that are associated and adjacent to um, that polygon also um, gets marked out so no impacts are located in there. Um, we also have recent uh, survey biological and, and botanical surveys for that site. So we'll make sure we have the latest and greatest information for where species are located. Um, as it relates to stormwater, uh, we did not present, uh, pull together the stormwater report as in tie and bond. Um, Chris, I don't know if you were able to get any additional information from um, the folks at Eversource who pulled that together. Yeah, so that was um, conducted by Burns and McDonald. Uh, Aaron, I know we had talked about that on the phone today. I did, I did put some feelers out. I, I did not get a response yet. Um, I mean, vaguely, where the pervious and impervious changes mostly occur is this new switch gear is um, some somewhat like a small building. It's a it looks like a large trailer, I guess you'd call it. It's it's you know it's nicer than that, but um so it's roofed. It's an impervious structure. Uh, we'll be removing some of the old foundations for the 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 former switch gear. Uh, that's where some of the the old impervious becomes now pervious gravel. Um, but to get an exact number for those though, you know, to 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 actually match. Um, exact structures to those numbers, I can I can forward you along any information from Burns and McDonald's. Yeah, and I wasn't looking for any specific numbers, more so okay. just what you just described, um, just sort of a narrative explanation of um, what the changes are going to be to the site in terms of um, pervious cover or removal of pervious cover. Um. I would say most of the site is also uh, impervious at this site. There is a, a stretch of grass in between the existing portion of uh, pavement and the existing fence line. Um, so that will be um, removed and gravel, stone gravel base will be put down um, where obviously there aren't buildings and equipment. And so just to clarify what, because uh, because Chris said, um, and just trying to make sure I understand this correctly. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, oh, I, I'm not sure I'm at the right place here on the plan. Um, it goes gray when I go to, to mark on it. Um, so the, the blue area that's outlined on the plan is the, is the new infrastructure that's being added to the site. Is that correct? Correct. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. There's, and the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry okay. I was just going to say the larger, rectangle the blue uh you know yes where you're where you're outlining there would be the new switch gear structure and that's coming just to the north of it from the old switch gear st structure which is uh, open aired right now but with concrete base that would be removed got it and and as of right now this is a you said a paved parking area like up in this area correct okay so what what you're saying as far as the storm water is concerned is that a portion of this the pavement would be removed and it would be returned to gravel. Is that correct? Correct. I believe that the uh, the ground surface within the substation is usually a uh, larger trap rock sort of stone. Okay, because it was um, a, a portion of the stormwater report, which specifically um, noted that there was, and this is this is why I was curious. It was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Well, I guess it's, so. It's a it's a reduction of open space, um, but there's there are noted um, uh, reductions in impervious parking area and driveway. So that accounts for where those areas are being reduced. Yeah, it, it, that the fence expansion goes partially across the driveway. There's um, 
ultimately two kind of discrete grass patches and then a, a small uh, asphalt, I guess, driveway into the substation. So yeah, that would be the, the impervious area that, that's converted into a gravel surface. And then the, the open space would be the, the grass patches that are, are now converted into uh, the gravel. Okay. All right. I just wanted to clarify that so that I could better understand sort of the, how those infiltration or how the runoff calculations were um, just so that it was clear to the commission, kind of the balance that was happening there. Sounds good. Okay. Sorry, Kate, did you have more? No, um, and I guess the last thing, just don't wanna go over any sort of time, would be the, our, our mitigation plan. Yeah. Um, so uh, although we're, we're slightly below the 20% threshold, um, no, they, knowing, our back and forth with Aaron from the very start of this project, almost I feel like a year ago at this point, um, we, we're we still gonna move forward with uh, some mitigation ideas and plantings. And, and as Aaron said, we submitted something uh, a bit last minute to the commission for review, but um, sorry, I just wanted to make sure I had the latest and greatest version that um, Chris had sent over. So, um, it would pretty much involve, as I said, the 4,255 square feet um, providing, knowing that we can't, it, it's not the most effective place to try to put in mitigation plantings uh, based al along the side of the substation and um, the most effective bang for our buck. So we pulled together kind of a mitigation cost for our trees, um, the planting labor, and then overall maintenance and monitoring for a three-year period, if that was to take place, um, to try to give an overall um, estimation of cost. So we were estimating um, the overall plant cost, tree labor cost, and um, maintenance and monitoring to be about $4,116. Um, we'd like to have a $1 per square foot overall fee for that, um, which would give us the $4,255 um, for overall mitigation funding, knowing that we are losing some areas of, of grass and um, a pervious area in that location, but um, understanding it's maybe not the most effective location to try to put some nice plantings um, back in that location. Can you... Um provide more detail on what your percentages are for existing alteration in the buffer zone? You said you're below 20%. Yeah. Um, Sam, when you were calculating that with Dan, did you have additional details for that? Yes, I do have um, a couple screenshots of how we calculated that, Erin. I can forward those over to you after the meeting or if you'd like me to dig them up now and share them. Yeah, I'm just wondering what you're, with the like what the current site alteration in the buffer is versus what the proposed site alteration is in the buffer zone for just totals. Yeah, and, and just to, to to reference, it's um part of part of the the reason behind that is is it is a large site and obviously already has significant alteration. So um you know calculating new alterations compared to the site put us at a, a relatively low number. Um, Hence why in, in our mitigation package, uh, we, we rather than going with a percentage, just looked for the total uh, square footage of impacts as mitigation. Yeah, absolutely. And I um, the reason that I'm asking is just so that the commission can take into consideration your total alteration. So if you're you're under 20%, it we only require mitigation for anything over 20%. So that's why, like, as they consider what your proposal for mitigation is, for example, if you're mm -hmm. only altering 22%, your proposal, you know, might be more um uh you know, beneficial to them than if you were altering 24%, so to speak. So you're actually altering less than what the bylaw, um, I mean, you're, if you're altering less than what the bylaw allows and you're still providing mitigation, then it's kind of a net gain. I, I don't know, I don't want to go above our allotted time, but uh, just, just quickly, I'd also like to say um, there was some debris identified in, in the, the north of the substation. Um, we weren't sure at first if that might have been an occupied, a homeless occupied structure, or if that was, uh, uh, talking to Aaron, it sounds like it actually may have been a, a formally used as a, um, a community garden. 
I believe you mentioned. So there, there's some debris still out there. We will be picking it up. It's uh, within the wetlands. So as part of this process, we'll go in hands and boot, pick up uh, any of the debris that sounds like now it was left over from, from a, a former community garden. So that'll get cleaned up um, as well. Thanks, Chris, Kitty, and Sam. Um, I, I think I am familiar with the pictures that you're talking about that we were looking at. It looked like an um, encampment to me. So mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's still there, but that could be potentially a sensitive situation. Has anyone investigated that? I mean, is it unoccupied or occupied or... Yeah, I've gone a few times to check if it's occupied. I, I agree. We've we've gone through this a lot, and um, uh, it, it obviously takes on a humanitarian component if it is occupied, and that would cause some more delays. Otherwise, it'd be quite easy to clean up. Um, so I will probably have community relations verify that, uh, but no, it doesn't appear to be occupied, and I, I have stopped by a few times. Um, okay. uh, I'm not sure a better you know solution other than continuing to check and, and making sure that... Um, it, it is not occupied. Right. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay. Any commissioner comments? I have a question. Bruce, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I apologize that I wasn't, um, yeah, this is only my second meeting, so this may have been discussed before. But in the description of the hearing, it talks about 21 manholes. And I drove by there and I sure couldn't figure out how there could be 21 manholes on that site. So, so I, uh, sorry, to, to answer that, 21 manholes are spawning from the intersection at, uh, I believe, Pleasant Street uh, up near the Commons and then running down to the substation. It's at the request of... Uh, the Amherst TBW, I suppose, I, I believe there's a um, a water line project going in or something similar, but uh, but yeah, that, those were going down roughly every 300 feet um, down College Street. Some of those are outside of jurisdiction, um, but we we brought that up in in, in the project. Yeah. So okay. and and just to clarify this because it was a little bit confusing in the application, I just want to clarify this. So um, when the original submission came in, um, the the uh, applicant's representative had had mapped the Faring Brook as being perennial. And so they had cast a 200 foot riverfront off of the bank of the Faring Brook. And when with the 200 foot riverfront, it put the manholes that were that are being added in College Street um, in the roadway, it put them in the 200 foot riverfront area. Um, once I reviewed the plan and I spoke to the um, the representative, I said, um, you know, just to be to be clear that the fairing is an is an intermittent stream and so it only has a hundred foot buffer, so that it was corrected to add the hundred foot buffer to the stream instead of the two hundred foot riverfront, and when they did that, it took the um, manholes in College Street out of CONCOM jurisdiction. So just a point of clarification because it wasn't discussed at the uh, on the call, but it was it was addressed in the revised materials that were provided to us. And, and I appreciate you told me this already, but I thought I'd bring it up again just because it's still on the descriptor in front of everyone. And yeah, so. no, that's great. Thank you for doing that, Bruce. That was good that you caught that. Thanks, Bruce. Anyone else? Okay, um, I mean, I guess I have a question about the mitigation proposal, given that we're in the buffer and there's a dollar amount on it. And I don't think we received that in our packet to review. Um, I'd be interested in reviewing it. And also we have some precedent for approving this kind of thing um, and comparing it to what we've done before. So having the chance to review it and um, compare it just for the commission. Um, in addition, maybe um, I'm interested in the NHESP uh, confluence of this project. And since it is on the boundary lines, um, I don't know, Aaron, so I guess it doesn't trigger a notification to the NHESP, but perhaps the proposed mitigation would if it, um, coincides with the core habitat that's mapped in this project area. 
Yeah, and so part of that is just a clarification, I guess, um, with Chris, which is when we were on site, we had talked a little bit about um, Eversource doing some invasive management, because I guess that there was some invasive species that were along the um, the stream that runs along the side of the um, substation. And also there was some um, Japanese knotweed that was across the street near the poles. And so we had just talked anecdotally in the field about whether Eversource was going to want to do um, any invasives management uh, relative to those invasive species on the project. I don't know. That's what that's what Michelle is getting at with because I mentioned that it might be part of the mitigation package, but I wasn't sure what you guys agreed on. I uh, we we would prefer to to look towards compensation. Um, again, I know plantings on this site don't really work because of the limited scope of this work and and the kind of the the wider range of invasives. Um, you know, we're looking to replace just the, the the poles. They're they're not quite roadside. They're they're but they're close. Um, and that knotweed is substantially. Uh, more than that, I, I think that this project would have trouble trying to sustain that. There is some invasives in the bank. Um, I mean, it's a it, I, I, if it's uh, pushed from the commission. I mean, we're we're willing to uh, to work and, and obviously want to to appease all members, but uh, it'd be difficult to try to control that in perpetuity only because it's um, you know it's it's a maintained car garage, I believe, on one side, and then a substation on the other side, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a drainage channel that, that may not be the, the healthiest resource. Um, it probably will continue to, to overgrow if we don't, you know, maintain that um, constantly. So our, you know, our mitigation, and, and it was discussed, it ideally would be to uh, go to a fund that could, you know, the town could use for obviously the interest of the Wetland Protection Act, but in, in a spot that would probably be more effective. Understood. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So we're looking at an in lieu fee contribution. Um, I don't know if anybody on the commission has any comments on that, but um, I'd, like to, I'd like to see some um, calculations, maps, whatever you came to, because you did propose a number. I'd just like to see some background on that. Any commissioners have any comments? Not many people were here when we set that precedent, but it has been set. No, so I remember that precedent, and I think yeah. your questions are valid. So I didn't. Thank you, it. Laura. Okay. I was All here. Right. All right. So um, I guess so. We're moving towards maybe a continuance based on provision of additional information for the mitigation compensation. So just a reminder, Michelle, to take public comment. Sorry, thank you. No, Any public okay. comment? Okay, I'm seeing none. Okay, in that case, I'm looking for a motion from commissioners to um, continue. Continue the um, public hearing for Ty and bon College Street to 8923 at 740 p.m. So moved. Alex on the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Bruce on the second. Okay. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, does that sound good? Chris and Kate, do you have any further questions? No, no, if um, that, that sounds great. And um, Aaron, I provided a, a brief write up of our synopsis. And if, if you can provide that to the commissioners, and if you know, um, it's it's a little bit arbitrary, uh, we're, we're, you know, filling grass, and we're, we're kind of referencing well, what makes sense planting wise. So if, if there's, um, you know, we can obviously have a back and forth if there's, if you if you feel there's a, a, a you know, a better way to mitigate, but this seemed to make sense. In okay, my mind, so. great. The more maps and details you can provide, the better we can sort of evaluate what we're doing with the in lieu fee mitigation. But thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on. 
Okay, so SWCA on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for construction of a gravel parking lot on lot 13 Olympia Drive. So this motion is going to be continued. Um, yeah, and this was to, a, yeah. a, a failure by the Daily Hampshire Gazette. The legal ad was submitted to them. Um, I was provided a, um, a proof. I approved the proof and it, it didn't make it into the newspaper. Um, I put the response in from the paper because I asked like what what's going on here. Uh, this is the second time that we've had a an error on a legal ad. Um, so, yes. Okay, thanks. So it's sort of a administrative error. I see Alex has a question. Go ahead, Alex. I have a question. I just need to step away for maybe three or four minutes, and I'll let you know when I'm back. Okay. Um, I was on the site visit this morning, if they're going to report on that. I don't see anybody here to report on that. Erin, do you? Let's yeah. See, see um, yeah. And so, and just an update on that. Um, so I'm not, I know that Kristen presented, this was before we knew that there was a failure of the legal ad. Um, so um, I was told after the fact that the the legal ad didn't make it in the paper. So um, we're going to have to basically reopen the hearing and explain kind of what the re reasoning or rationale was for needing to basically start back over at square one with the presentation. Okay. Um, so just just to kind of clarify that, because it, it was confusing to all of us when we were talking about it in the field today. Um, so we'll we'll continue to August 9th at 730. And at that point, we're just going to reopen the hearing and start over. And then we'll explain that there was a problem with the legal ad that forced us to basically reopen the public hearing. OK, I will not be here on August 9th. Is that going to pose a problem with um, quorum? Um, we have Bruce, I don't, Andre, I don't think and so. Alex. OK, I, I don't we can talk about that so. offline if so. Okay. Um, Bruce, you have a question? No, I just I went to the site visit and two things that struck me was so we went two weeks ago and then we went back and it was uh, much clearer about where the end of the construction was, where the different lines were, the flagging was a lot better. And so I think if we could encourage the flaggers to do their job earlier. So we don't have to go back and see it a second time to actually understand it. That would be helpful. The other thing is there is a vernal pool there, and it was, I mean, just offhand, I would say it was at least a foot, if not two feet, higher than two weeks ago. And it was quite extraordinary um, to see that difference, just given the amount of water that we've seen. Um, so those are my higher order observations. There was a lot of discussion, which was good, but let's, uh, I remain concerned about how that vernal pool is going to be protected. Thanks, Bruce. I think based on state and local laws that we can consider that vernal pool to be essentially a certified vernal pool and give it all the benefits and protections that we would at the state and local level. So regardless of the, yeah, as stated by you and um, Aaron and everybody else prior, I think we can establish that we are considering that to be a certified vernal pool, even, as it, even if it hasn't gone through the certified vernal pool process. And, and that that's um, based on local and state law. So um, regardless of the current or, you know, preceding water level. Okay, anybody else on this one? If And if not, I'm looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for lot 13, Olympia Drive, notice of intent to 8-9-23 at 7 I will oh, sorry. provide yes, the please. motion since I was there and Alex isn't here. Okay. I can second that, Michelle. Thank you. So Bruce on the first, Laura on the second. Um, Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. I'm an aye. I think... Um, Alex, Alex is an I. Oh, Alex is an I. Thank you, Alex. Okay, great. All right, up next. Um, yeah, I printed out the wrong 
Are we on to administrative businesses? Uh, no, uh, we still have to continue 46 Faring. Okay, Faring Street. So Goddard Consulting for LLC 52 Faring Street LLC for the construction of a single family house with garage and associated site work in preparation of the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetation will end at 46 Faring Street. Um, we are look so we do not have a quorum. We have um, a, a, a dissimilar distribution of members for this conservation commission. And so we needed a full quorum of original members for anyone that is listening right now. We do not have that quorum. And so we are continuing to August 9th at 7.35. Erin, I am not going to be here on August 9th. Um, okay. That's okay, Michelle, because um, uh, one of the members of the team that's presenting the application has a due date for a baby right around that time. So they are likely uh, likely not going to be wanting to present at that meeting anyways. So um, I don't think that's going to be the end of the world, but I will let them know. Okay. So I, I our motion as stated is to August 9th, but knowing that I will not be there, should we postpone that to a later date? Um, I don't, I don't think so because um, just in the, in the interests of notifying abutters um, who might not be on this call, who might be on uh, on um, August 9th. And the reason I say that is because I did speak to a couple of butters who um, knew that the meeting was continued to August 9th or that it was going to be. Um, and just because abutters won't be re-notified, just it would be good for us to kind of keep giving people benchmarks so that they know when it's actually going to be heard. Okay. Well then, commissioners, I'm looking for a motion. I move to continue the public hearing for 49 Fearing Street, notice of intent to August 9, 2023 at 7.35 p.m. Okay, I'll Alex, second that. Alex on the first, Laura on the second. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, great. Are we moving on to other business? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Spalding Street. So um, we had a request for certificate of compliance for 51 Spalding Street. Um, folks might recall this. Um, application was for expansion of an existing parking area. Um, mm -hmm. I went out to the site and um, did a post erosion control inspection. And um, I did um, let me just stop sharing for a second so that I can pull up the photos. I did uh, take photos on the site. The site looked stable. Um, it looked like everything had been um, constructed as per the, the plan set. I didn't see any compliance issues. There are a couple ongoing conditions in the order of conditions which would need to, um, you know, remain in force. So it would be potentially um, a full um, certificate of compliance with ongoing conditions associated with it. And I'm just going to share the photos for everybody so you can see what the site looks like. Um, Michelle, did you want to bring up the issue about the plantings? Sure. Well, so I noted that in these pictures, there's American boxwood planted, American boxwood, sort of a misnomer because that is a Eurasian species that's non-native. Generally, in our order of conditions, we specify that only native plants should be planted. Erin provided a map of the actual boundary line of our jurisdiction and there's probably about two plants planted in that jurisdictional area um those two right an arborvitae um hybrid and perhaps a boxwood so at issue is that we already approved these plans and on the plans it was specifically specified <laughs> that there would be boxwood planted so it's our bad but um future in the future going forward I think that like when things are maybe 
so we approved it. There was an amendment. There was differences. We they they pulled it back. That was great, but we just didn't notice that the plantings included non-native species, and we approved it anyway. So my only comment is that um, maybe we should just look a little harder next time. I'm not gonna not recommend issuing the order of conditions at this point because we already approved the we already approved it, and it's like two plans. But I'm just kind of bringing it up for commissioner come for commissioner. Um, you know, consideration. Yes. 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 Thank you. <laughs> so that's my only comment on it. Otherwise, it seems to look good. Do we have any other comments from commissioners on this one? Yeah. Aaron, when we issue a certificate of compliance, I notice they still have temporary BMPs in place. Yes. That's because I was doing the erosion control inspection when I was out there um, for this site visit, they still had the erosion controls in. So I gave them the okay when I was on site to, that they could then remove the erosion controls um, because the site is, is fully stabilized. Um, so that's why they're in the photo. All right. Typically do we, uh, yeah, it looks like they just have straw bottle down and, and they potentially have stabilized with their vegetative stabilization. Uh, at any point, do we require folks to show that they are not creating additional disturbance when they remove their sediment controls or erosion controls? Just thinking like things like, yeah. in the future, you know, when you tear that out, you basically create a new trench of disturbance. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I think that's an excellent point um, to to require that they basically seed down the area underneath the erosion controls. Um, so yeah, that's, um, and we can we can include that um, as a condition of approval that the, um, that the areas where the erosion controls were uh, are uh, seeded down with grass seed. And I see the, the owner is um, in the audience and he's raising his hand. Would it be okay if I bring him in? Yes, please do. I see Bruce Allen. Yes, Bruce Allen. Hold on. We hear you now. I, I'm sorry, but with regard to the boxwood planting, that's probably a good 20 feet away from the 25 foot wetland boundary. So I think someone's not looking at the map correctly, but. Um, or the, the plot plan correctly. Secondly, uh, the wattles have all been removed and those areas have been seeded and the grass is growing very nice and green. So I just wanted to pass that along. Yeah, so Bruce, the issue was um, the commission actually has a hundred foot buffer from the wetlands. So the question was whether the boxwood was planted in the buffer. Usually we have a standard condition that there's only native species to be planted in the um, buffer zone or resource areas. But in this case, it was it's like on the cusp of the hundred foot buffer zone. So that's why um, we're, you know, obviously not raising a big issue about it. It's more so mm -hmm. for future um when we have an application where for example somebody might plant a non-native species in the buffer zone we might um, ask them to remove it or replace it with a native species okay right and we also have a three-year monitoring period for those plants so mm -hmm. monitoring a non-native plant for three years <laughs> doesn't, doesn't sound like a good deal anyway we're that's beyond us we're not raising that issue does Commissioners, any questions for Bruce while well, we have them online? Okay, well, um, then I guess we're looking for a motion to issue a certificate of compliance. Um, I can read it or somebody else can. And just, just to note before we, we do read it that the special conditions um, are the ongoing conditions sort of in perpetuity um, for the site. So that's why those are, we're seeing those perpetual conditions listed there as uh, um, part of the approval. And and what are 21, 22, 23, 24, Erin? Um, those are our standard boilerplate 
Um, so those would include things like you can't use salt in the buffer zone, you can't use um, chemical fertilizers in the buffer zone. Um, uh, I don't have the order of conditions up in front of me, but they're sort of like our standard boilerplate of things that we generally, when we issue an order of conditions, kind of permanently restrict. Okay, any questions from the landowner in this case? Nope. No. Okay. okay, thanks, Bruce. All right, commissioners, I'm looking for a motion. All right, I, I move to a uh, motion to move to issue the certificate of compliance for DEP number 089 0700 with ongoing special conditions 9, 10, and perpetual conditions 21, 22, 23, and 24. Jason on the motion. Second. Alex on the second. Okay, Jason. Aye. Chris. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm an I. Um, okay, I understand this is a rental property. Is that correct? Um. I think it's owner occupied. Okay. Okay, I'm just bringing that up because um, some of those perpetual conditions might get lost in the fray of um, rental occupancies. So, mentioning it. Okay, moving on. Um, we're looking for an extension of order conditions on 33 Mountain View Circle, and I I think some of you visited the site today. Yes, we did. Um, the project is a um, almost entirely a restoration project. There was a, a significant stream crossing um, that existed previously on Mr. Predmore's property. Basically, um, it, it, it's the, the Plum Brook, and he undertook this amazing restoration of the stream, um, which the project's been completed. And I have um, some photos. I think I uploaded them to you guys, but I will um, try to navigate to them right now if I'm able. But the, the stream looks great. Um, the um, It's just a really, really nice restoration. I think it was the first restoration project that I sort of oversaw. Um, this this area that you're looking at right here was previously a massive um, area of basically fill with a concrete um, headwall uh, on either side and a two foot culvert going through. So you can see it was grossly undersized and basically serving as a dam to the Plum Brook. And Mr. Predmore pulled it out and restored um, the river, which is amazing. He still um, has a, a small footbridge, which he's currently constructing, um, which was permitted as part of this project. He also, there was a sewer line. Um, I don't know if it was a repair or a tie-in um, from uh, the roadway, which was completed, but he also has a, um, one more part, I guess, like a, a second phase of the project, which is that he's converting a um, three season porch to a vestibule for his house. So he's he completed sort of phase one and he's still working on the second phases of the project. That's why he's requesting additional time from the permit. He is going to be coming back to us because he um, has determined that he had to relocate the um, location of the footbridge. And part of the reason for that was because it was too low lying and um, wouldn't have provided enough clearance for the bridge over the river in order to meet the stream crossing standards. And this, again, the, the bridge was proposed in a section of the river that had been restored. So until we sort of saw the finished grade of the restoration, it was difficult to nail down the exact location of the bridge. So he's going to be coming back to us with an amendment, um, a minor administrative change, basically, to, to share those details with us. But he's still sort of penning them to submit to us. He's um, modifying the plans right now so he can share those with us. Um, so that's a general overview. Thanks, Aaron. Comments from commissioners? Bruce? Well, um, I'd let Alex give the, he has much more expertise than I do in this 
type of thing, but it was gratifying to go there and see something that was genuinely re restored uh, in a way that you'd want to see it in lots of other places where there are culverts or there's just, you know, streams and uh, sections of streams and rivers that are completely underground. And yeah, it was only about 30 feet, but it was still pretty significant. Thanks, Bruce. Alex, did you want to? As I understand it, as I, am I on mute? No. Nope. As I understand it, it was a voluntary uh, restoration project on his part that he paid for himself, it was not cheap. Um, there was the, the culvert that he pulled out was big enough you could drive a truck across it. And it was access to a farm access to a field across the way. And he's done a beautiful job. Um, um, it's his, it's a pet project of his, he's very proud of it. And it was a delight to visit with. And um, uh, I wish we had more people like him. It's nice for somebody to voluntarily daylight a stream. Great. Thanks for visiting Bruce and Alex. Um, any other commissioner comments on it, concerns? I just no. want to say, I remember what it looked like, Aaron, and it's uh, it's pretty amazing what it looks like now, so. It really is. It was a um, unbelievable transformation because I was there right before the culvert was pulled. And so mm -hmm. it was in like the most, um, horrible condition that you could imagine it was yeah. just deteriorating crumbling away and it was sinking. Like dead and now it's alive which is pretty amazing so. yeah yeah to watch the stuff get pulled out of the river and watch them restore the banks was just it was awesome so i'm really really happy about it great this is the good stuff yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. change the landscape yep yeah Okay, well then we're looking for a motion to issue the three-year extension on over conditions so we can finish the project. I will make that motion to approve the, no, hang on, which one am I reading? The middle one. The middle one, yes. Um, for 33 Mountain View Circle, uh, making a motion um, to issue a three-year extension uh, to order of conditions DEP 0890656. All right, we're on the motion. Bruce on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Laura? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, I think we are going to have, oh, Chris Valente is here. I don't know, um, Luke Beeson, if you're a part of this project or not. If you are, feel free to raise your hand and I can pull you in. Yes, you are. Okay, great. I'll pull you in. Um, while Chris and Luke are joining, I'm just going to do a quick share screen to to kind of give a little bit of an intro on this. Um, so the commission approved maybe two or three meetings ago a um, trail project on the Holyoke Range. It was order of conditions that had been submitted to us by the Kestrel Land Trust and the um, AMC. And um, as part of that application, there were sites two through four, which were three wetland crossings um, where there was proposed bog bridging. And when myself, Andre, and Alex were out in the field, one of the things we observed was that the wetland area was really wide and had been disturbed pretty significantly by mountain biking. And so the concern and also the concern was raised in the field for emergency vehicle access. Um, the commission had included a condition in the order of conditions to have a strip of sort of stabilized gravel running along the edge of the um, bog bridging so that that would be accessible for um, for mountain bikes uh, and that they wouldn't be tearing up the wetland area when they were driving through there and um, because of natural heritage and endangered species program, they, I guess, were unable to mm -hmm. um, modify that to include the gravel strip, but they did come through with a proposal to modify instead of doing a bog bridge to do this um, punchin um, bridge, which um, I did the calculations for to see what 
the difference of impact would be. And when you take into account the original bog bridge that was approved, as well as the two foot wide strip of gravel, the um, punchin bridge that's being proposed by Kestrel um, reduces impacts on all three of the sites. So site, um, well, I call them site one, two, and three. It's actually two, three, and four. But um, the the first crossing was would reduce the square footage by 94 square feet the second reduced the square footage by 74 and on the third it would reduce the impact by 88 square feet so um it's you know i think that what they're proposing is a, is a better solution than having the the gravel strip running along the side of the bog bridge uh, i just wanted to share that with the commission in the lead up to this and um chris and luke please take it away Hi, everyone. Uh, Chris Volante, uh, Stewardship Director at Kestrel Land Trust. And with me is Luke Beeson, who is our land steward. And Luke is going to be the on the ground person assisting Appalachian Mountain Club crew on this project. So that was a great introduction, Erin. I don't have a lot to add to what you said. Um, I do the other. Um, concern that was raised by the commission at the site visit was um, emergency access uh, for ATVs. Um, yeah. And when we spoke with Paul Janagi at DCR, he, uh, who proposed this alternative, he said that they have other routes they can bring emergency vehicles through on, so they don't need that route. And he didn't see it as a concern. So the way he saw it is the, um, the punch-in will uh, solve the bike problem because it'll have ramps and um, the emergency vehicles he didn't see as an issue. Thanks, Chris. Luke, did you want to add anything? Uh, nothing in particular. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have about the plans or installation process or anything like that. Okay, commissioners, any questions? I don't see any. I mean, I think that Andre had raised some questions about the emergency vehicles, so that's been addressed. Um, it looks it looks good. It looks like the impacts have been lessened and everything has been addressed. I don't have any particular um, issues with it. So unless anybody has any more questions, I think we're looking for a motion. We need to approve the minor administrative DEP 089 0715 without correspondence from the dated July 14, 2023. I will second that. All right, Bruce on the first, Laura on the second, uh, Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. Um, I know, I'm an aye. Great. Thank you, Chris and Luke, for being here. Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks, guys. Bye now. Good luck with the project. Bye. So, Michelle, before we move to adjourn, and I know that will happen quickly, there were a couple just um, sort of minor administrative things that uh, I would just like to give a very quick update on to the commission, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. So, bear with me. I just want to make sure that I um, cover these things. Um, so, um, I had prepared uh, or I had shared with the commission an update regarding the Eversource um, uh, application of herbicide on the um, uh, buckthorn, uh, glossy buckthorn out on the right of way. And Bruce had asked about the um, WMO4 permit that's required. Um, I did upload that to your I think I uploaded it to your box, but it was only late this afternoon. So that permit is is there. They initially didn't think that they needed it because they thought it was only required for open water applications. But when I made them aware of it, they did um, they did provide the permit to me. So thank you, Bruce, for dotting the I's and crossing the T's. I have uh, a, a special 
back in my mind about herbicides. So yeah, that's fantastic. I, no, I jump out. I uh, I am very happy. Our two new members are really uh, contributing value right off the bat. Here is really really nice. Um, so thank you so much. Um, let me see. I wanted to give you guys an update on the project that's located behind the Florence Savings Bank on Northeast Street. It's the Northeast Commons. It's kind of a large um, sort of apartment complex. Um, and Bruce, you had asked about sites that have wetland restoration or wetland mitigation yeah. or wetland, what they call wetland replication, which is essentially a recreation of a wetland. Um, that's one of those sites that has um, a a wetland replication on it, which I'd be happy to take you out to so you can see what it looks like. Um, I can report happily report that the wetland replication is doing fantastic on that site. No surprise, because when I came, I mean, the project had been permitted before I got here, but that entire site was wetland. Um, and it was only identified as having a small isolated pocket of wetland on it. But um, it was all wetland and so where they re replicated uh, it took beautifully and um, they've had some erosion problems on that site i've been monitoring them really closely because it's such a tight um, footprint of the parking area and the building to the wetland so i've been really trying to keep a close eye on them and with the rains that we had recently they had some issues I did get an update from the email I put in your packets that they were doing some cleanup of erosion and sediment controls. So um, that they've they've said that they've addressed and I'll go out and follow up on that. Um, well, I would value going on that because sure. I live near it and I yeah. use the bank and I go by there and just from the street, it's really hard to tell yeah. what's going on. So. Well, Bruce, um, I'll reach out to you. And um, again, okay. any other commissioners who want to join are welcome uh, to go out and have a look at the wetland replication area. So feel free to either shoot me an email or just let me know if you want to tag along for that and we can go out and have a look at it. Um, that would be that would be great. I'll go. Okay, super. I'd like to see it too. Maybe yeah. we could do it in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks, Anne. Um so Michelle, your your preferred time is morning. Is there a certain day of the week that is preferred for everyone? Um, I mean, it's not necessarily. I, I think just like figure something out and okay. I will Did, or will not make it. Or maybe I could drive by and look at it or something. I mean, what is what does Friday look like for you guys around? Friday nine? is not great. <laughs> I mean, is it the day after tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That's that's fine. Work. You want to do this yeah. Friday morning? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to. I'll be gone from the 31st to the 10th. So. Oh, well, that's interesting. And we should kind of keep that in mind that Bruce and I will be gone. I mean, I'll until be the on 10th of August. The meeting, but not. Precisely. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. gotcha. What time gotcha. Friday? Uh, 9 a.m. Um, the other thing is on that one, parking in that location is very dangerous so i would recommend that we either that members either park at cumberland farms and walk over or in front of florence savings bank and that we plan to meet um uh actually maybe we could just meet on the sidewalk in front of florence savings bank and walk over together just for the sake of safety and not trying to um, parallel park on southeast street because there's a lot of construction vehicles there and where is this again um, so the, in East Amherst, um, there's, uh, the intersection of, um, uh, Southeast Street and College Street. Uh, there's a Florence Savings Bank there. Um, and it's, it's behind the Florence Savings Bank building on Northeast Street. Yeah, there's a newly constructed building back there? Yes. And you're, anybody who wants to come Friday morning is welcome to join and I'll let the contractor know that the commission's coming Once out. Once you're there, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. That's yeah I live right there. I live right by that. So I, okay. I thought that's what you were talking about, but I just wanted to okay. Uh, confirm. Okay. Dave, I saw you pop up. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody that when... You know that site they're they're mostly inside now but when you're on an active construction site mm -hmm. we are kind of guests if you will of the of the owner and the contractor so 
you know, I'm glad Aaron's going to reach out. And, you know, when it is a group, I was just on a site at UMass and, you know, safety is number one. So we just want to make sure that, you know, when, when vehicles are backing up, if, if anybody is moving on that site, just stick, stick together. And yeah, we just want to make sure you're all safe and, and the contractor doesn't run into any problems or the owner. So okay. thanks Dave. We don't need hard hats or anything. <laughs> well, mean, Often. that's <laughs> yeah sometimes you do sometimes yeah. you do need a hard hat and sometimes yeah but in this particular case we can skirt around the almost the entire project um along the wetland boundary so that okay. should be no problem but uh i i can talk to the project manager he he i let him know that i was speaking to you guys about this tonight um so i'll let him know that the commission's coming out to take a look on friday and he can kind of accompany us so that the others know that we're there Okay, thanks, Aaron. So everybody look out for that invite. Um, I just add to like following um, comments. Uh, I did see that there was a um, KP law notice, um, which was sort of a comment on our bylaws in relation to the railroad notice, uh, uh, butter notification. Yeah, I, okay. I, I was going to be my next, um, okay. my next item. So I would encourage everybody to read that. I don't really want to read it um, in an open meeting or even pull it up in an open meeting because that is privileged um, information between uh, the town attorney and the conservation commission. But just to sort of provide a brief update to the board, and, and this kind of gets back to, I think Alex had brought up at a previous meeting, our need to um, do some sort of minor administrative updates to our bylaw regulations. This is one of those that I would add on to that list. Um, okay, so just to provide a little bit of history, and I'm going to provide a really quick snapshot. Um, I think it was around 2021, the railroad came to us with a request for determination. The railroad is required to come to us basically to determine their spray and no spray zones as part of their five-year operation and maintenance plan that they conduct. Um, and they are exempt from the regulations because of their entity being um, a railroad and um, they provide like a public service. So they, they do fall under an exemption and they're under a separate set of regulations, which are federal regulations. And um, Initially, they came to us, this was prior to the revision of our bylaw, and they did not notify abutters. They came to us and the commission actually denied the permit. Part of the reason for that was that the railroad didn't show up for any of the hearings, and we had asked for some updates to the plans to include some sensitive areas that have been identified, which they didn't do. And as a result of that, the commission ended up denying the application and telling them to sort of reassess the the rail line and include the sensitive areas that had been excluded on the original application. They did resubmit, but they dug in their heels that they did not want to notify abutters. And I basically pointed to our new bylaw regs, which in the bylaw regulations, it states that um, for requests for determination that abutter notices have to be provided and um, that the commission cannot provide a waiver to the abutter notices. So it basically means everybody has to do abutter notices. They, um, I guess, objected to that as well. And that was based on federal highway regulation. And um, there is some case law precedent that basically um, would make it difficult in court for the commission to stand behind that abutter notice requirement. And I did talk with KP Law and they confirmed that that would be something that that the town attorney would recommend that we um, sort of not require of the railroad because of that reason. So um, if it's okay with the board, I'm just gonna let the railroad know that we'll continue with the application and just not do the abutter notices and that we are going to have to do a an amendment to our regulations to basically exempt the railroad from that requirement for that reason but um for the time being i think we just have to follow town council's advice or at least that's my recommendation to the board thanks aaron bruce and we uh, advise the abutters ourselves so the rail line runs north to south through uh, the center, you know, through Amherst, um, and it's a significant number of abutters, and that's part of the reason why the, the railroad 
um, objected. So it's on the measure of thousands of abutters, um, I think, or at least multiple hundred. Um, so yeah, um, it's kind of a big president. hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. And when you you keep saying the railroad, do you mean Amtrak? Um it is the New England Central Railroad is the the owner of the rail rail um the rails themselves there. So I was just wanting to give you guys an update that I did follow up on that and that that was their guidance so yeah, thank you and i just wanted that to be clarified with the commission because yes. that was integrated into our bylaws but it seems to be there's a precedent for it that we might need to change something and yeah there's going to be a lot of spraying <laughs> that won't have a butter notification and that's just <clears throat> anyway um this, the last thing I wanted to say was that um, we we had mentioned that we had an in lieu fee precedent, and I was wondering, since this might be coming up in the future and we have several new members, if it could be put in our packet, um, perhaps the PowerPoint that we had and the calculator, just so people can see it and see what we've used in the past while we're um, um, hearing new notice, notices. And that would be for the the upcoming um, August 9th meeting. Yeah, and if if need be, it could be um, the the details of the previous hearing could be removed so that it's a blank a blank calculator. But the, but the de facto like the facts are there. Um, yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. I see. Alex has his hand up. Yeah, I suggest that Aaron not wait for the packet for the next meeting, but send it out on its own so people have a chance, uh, a, a, a long, a big opportunity to look at it and uh, call you if they have questions yeah. so that we can shorten that discussion when we actually meet next. Okay, thanks, Alex. Michelle developed it, by the way. She did a great job. Yeah, it is a work in progress or a living document. Um, so um, commissioner comments are welcome. Okay, I think that's it. As, as long as anyone doesn't have anything else to say, I think we're looking for a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. We'll second that. <laughs> All right, Alex on the first, Laura on the second, Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. Then I'm an aye. All right. We're second in that. Uh, uh, Laura. Okay. Um, well, you got a soft landing, Jason. <laughs> yeah. <Thanks>. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you all. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good job, Michelle. Thanks, Alex. Bye.